Good morning, everybody. It's January 24th, Sunday morning. I'd like to welcome you here this morning, and uh, thank you for uh, joining me. Uh, one of the things before I want to start, I want to do my magic nine ball. Uh, it's called a magic, sarcastic nine ball. I got this as a gift from Amy, one of my staff, and uh, it gives sarcastic answers. So I want to do this and just shake it up, and I want to ask this question. Will people give a like or get, leave a comment at the end of this devotional? When it's posted, come on, magic, sarcastic nine ball. It says, yes, unless I mess it up. Well, if I mess it up, I'll know why you don't leave a like or a comment. So today I want to talk about something that's very important. Uh, it's about judgment. I talked about it last week and this week. I want to talk, to talk about it again. You see, God doesn't need perfect people to accomplish his plan. He just needs people. He'll work on those around him to get the to get the plan in motion. But there's a story about J.K. Rowling that uh, probably many of you don't know. Now, J.K. Rowling writes that uh, when she was a single mother, now she's the writer of the Harry Potter series, when she was a single mother, uh, she was living on social assistance. And when she speaks about those days, she says that she felt alone, depressed, and was completely broke. And during that time, she was writing the Harry Potter book. It took seven years to complete that book. And a lot of the time, she wondered if it was even worth any effort to do it because she was so depressed. And finally, her book was finished and she sent it off to various publishing companies hoping to get it published. But it was rejected 12 times. Finally, someone offered her a measly $4,000 to publish it. Today, after selling over 500 million books in the Harry Potter series, she is now worth nearly a billion dollars. You see, J.K. Rowling came out of nowhere. Nobody believed in her. Nobody was sitting in a bookstore waiting for her first book to come out. In fact, only a thousand copies of the first book were originally printed. Of the, of, the, of the thousand, 500 were sent to the local libraries. Those copies now are worth $42,000 each, but at the time, nobody thought they'd even be checked out of the library. You know, it's possible that the first 12 publishers looked at the cover page, read the title, and immediately judged what was inside. After all, if there's nothing great on the outside, there's probably a good chance there's nothing good on the inside either. And that makes sense. I suspect publishers get tons of submissions from unknown authors all the time, hoping they would get published. And the truth is, most published books aren't very profitable. And J.K. Rowling was just one of a hopeful pile of authors that would send in their books. And there was no reason to believe she'd be any different than those other ones. But they were wrong. You see, the publisher had a problem. They couldn't see the future or the potential. In many ways, we do the same thing, don't we? Maybe not with books, but we do it with people. We look at people around us, in our office, in our neighbors, neighborhoods, even in our families, and we don't see what they can be. Instead, we see what they are right now. You see, our instinct is to look at someone's outward behavior and appearance and we make assumptions about who they are and what they're going to be doing. I don't think we do it intentionally. It's just that sometimes even without knowing anything about someone, we look at them and we assume we know their story. We easily put people into categories, don't we? We make assumptions about who they are and why they act the way they do. And because of this, we think we know what kind of person they are. I think we make judgment calls about people all the time. We do this at home with our significant other, with our children, our siblings, and even our parents. We make judgment calls about people at work, judging them because if they don't work as hard as we do. And some people even judge others at church. A new person comes to visit the church and, and people make judgment calls about them because they look different, they smell different, they may be dirty, or they, they know who they are from the community. We seem to judge who does and doesn't belong. You see, we make these judgments based on what we see from the person's behavior. Sure, they could be different than what we think, but probably not. So it's easy to make a judgment call based on what we know, or rather what we think we know about a person. 
But this is nothing new because people have always found ways to categorize others and judge people. For example, in the ancient ancient Jewish community, people would often make presumptive judgments about who God liked or didn't like, and who God would bless or who God would curse, or who he used or who he wouldn't use. And it was all based on who a person was and or what they did. This was especially true for a person I'm going to mention today, a woman named Rahab. Now, Rahab's story is found during a key moment in Israelites' history, more than a thousand years before Jesus appeared on earth, in fact. At the time, the Israelites had been wandering in the desert for 40 years, and finally they arrived in Canaan, the place God had told them would be theirs. But there was a problem. People were already living there. Even though people already lived in the land, Joshua, the Israelites' leader, believed in God's promise. So he sent spies into the border city called Jericho. It was their job to gauge how difficult it would be to take over the land. While the spies were in Jericho, the king found out, and in fear for the, for the spies' lives, Rahab hid them in a house. In Joshua 2, 2 and 5, it says this, Someone told the king of Jericho, Some Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent orders to Rahab, Bring out the men who have come into your house, for they have come to he- here to spy out the whole land. Rahab had hidden the two men, but she replied, Yes, the men were here earlier, but I didn't know who they were and where they were from. They left the town at dusk as the gates were about to close. I don't know where they went. If you hurry, you can probably catch up to them. Rahab outsmarted the king's men and helped the spies get out of the city. She was on God's side, helping God's chosen people, the Israelites. But that's not the entire story. If we look at the verse before Joshua 2, 2 and 5, it tells us this. Joshua secretly sent out spies from the Israelite camp at at the Acacia Grove. He instructed them, scout out the land on the other side of the Jordan River, especially around Jericho. So the two men set out and came to the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there that night. You see, Rahab was a prostitute. She wasn't exactly who we'd expect to be a hero in God's story. And yet God chose her for a very important role in his plan for the redeeming of humanity. God knew Rahab's sin, but he also knew her potential and he trusted her. Rahab's story continued. Israel's army took Jericho, and Joshua told his men to spare Rahab and her family's lives because of what she had done for the spies. Eventually, Rahab married one of the Israelites' men named Solomon, and that would be a great ending to a nice story about Rahab the prostitute. But Rahab's impact in the world went far beyond her story with the spies. If you turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, 1 to 17, you will notice it opens with a long list of names. They are names that chronicle Jesus' family tree. Reading it can be tedious, and for some, pointless. But there was a reason this list was included in Matthew. Matthew wrote this list to prove that Jesus was, in fact, who he said he was. It shows that he was the promised Messiah, that Jesus fulfilled the right prophecies and had the right family connections to be who he is and who he said he was. But what is interesting about this list is that there is someone whose name is there. Matthew 1 and 5 says, Solomon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Wow, Rahab the prostitute is part of Jesus' family tree. It seems God put a prostitute in the family line of Jesus. Rahab was Jesus' ancestor, a great, 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 many great grandmother. This might seem strange to you, but the list tells me something very interesting and very exciting. You see, it tells me God is interested in more than how we appear or what we do or what we have done. God doesn't make judgment calls based on what we see because he sees more than we do. He sees a person's heart. He sees potential, even in those who many people write off. God doesn't need perfect people to accomplish his plan. In fact, he uses all kinds of people for his plan. He uses broken people, righteous people, 
sinful people, influential people, and powerless people, and powerful people to accomplish whatever he wants to accomplish. Yes, we look at the people around us and make judgment calls all the time about who they are based on what we see. We judge by how people look, the way they talk, the things they do. We see their behavior and label them as a bad person. But no matter how well we think we know someone, we can't see what, God, what will happen when God enters their life. We can't know what he will do because we don't know what God has planned for them. We don't know what he could already be up to in their life and whether he wants us to be part of his plan for helping them get there. It doesn't take us to be a Christian or a churchgoer to see how judging others is damaging. Judging others hurts us and the people we judge. You see, the judgments we make ultimately affect how we treat others. But did you know our opinion of someone on the inside spills out in the way we act toward them? Whether it's what we say to them, what we say about them, or how we look at them. People who are being judged know they're being judged. Now, judging others based on what we see is a hard habit to break. But there are two ways we can begin to dial down our judgment calls about others. First, we need to assume the best of people. Not all judgments have to be negative. We can look at people and assume the best about them. We can choose to assume their intentions are good, that there may be more to their story than we know, that God hasn't written them off and he has a plan for them. We can assume there's more to a person than their current actions. And like Rahab, there's more going on in their future than we can see right now. And regardless, I think we'll be happier if we assume that everyone around us is doing the best they can. And if we do that, I think we'll treat them better. Secondly, we need to trust God with the rest. Here's what I mean by that. There's a 100% chance that if we assume the best about everyone around us, someone will let us down. There's also a 100% chance that some of their actions and decisions won't line up with our opinions of them. And when that happens, we'll be tempted to say, see, I knew that they were that way. Instead, we need to resist the temptation to make a judgment call. Because judging their actions isn't our job. It's God's job. And their story isn't over yet. Sure, they may not be acting the way we think they should, but we have no idea how the rest of their story will unfold. We need to trust God with their future. Trust that God knows more than we do, because he does. Thankfully, God doesn't judge us by what he sees, because if he did, we would all be found lacking. You see, God sees us totally different than we see each other. And because he does, we need to trust that he's at work in everyone's life as much as he's at work in ours. So today, I think it's important we think about the people we have been judging. What categories do you put them in? What assumptions about them and their future do we make? Now, what would it look like if we assumed the best about the person and trusted that God is at work in their life? Remember, whether they're a good or a bad person isn't our call. We only have to assume the best and trust God with the rest. Because God uses whoever he wants to use. And whether it's a prostitute like Rahab, a homeless person on the street, an alcoholic, a drug addict, or me or you, or whatever, whoever he will use for his plan and he can change their life. I thank you for listening to me this morning, and I pray that uh, uh, if you're judging someone or someone's judging you, that you'll just give it over to God and see the best in people. I pray if you uh, haven't given your heart to the Lord, that this moment you just say, Lord, Lord, uh, I forgive my sins. I believe in you. I want to do better. I want to be better. And he will do that for you, forgive you of your sins. Uh, just let me have a prayer with you before we go. Father God, I just thank you for those who are listening this morning. May you be with each and every one. May you touch their lives and may they feel your presence. Help us to stop judging others and help us to be better than uh, what we are right now. I pray you just love us, hold us close. And I pray for those who are sick and shut in, those who are hurting. I pray that this COVID would be disappeared by you and you would get things back to normal. 
I pray you just bless us now in Christ's name. Amen and amen. Goodbye, and until uh, I see you again next week.